Um, welcome everyone. Good morning. Hi, Melissa. This is North Madison Congregational Church, if you're just joining us. And it is Communion Sunday. So this is your opportunity to go and if you haven't already, prepare a little home communion for yourself. Anything you have works. Jesus used the bread and the cup because that was what was on the table. So if you have a bagel or a muffin, a uh, Ritz cracker, a cup of juice, a cup of tea or coffee. I know some of you have something a little stronger. You know what? <laughs> it's your communion. So if you'd like to prepare that, if you have a candle you'd like to light, this is the moment you can get those elements together if you haven't already. Also, if you're joining us on Facebook and you'd like to host a watch party, that helps us to uh, broaden our reach for folks who are trying to find us online. So we thank you if you'll do that as well. So I am Heather Arkovich, and I am the pastor here at North Madison Congregational Church in Diaspora. Our, and this is our virtual worship service. And I'm joined here in worship today by Sue Cristiano, who is our virtual deacon this morning, and Linda Giuliani, who is our, our minister of music and also our scripture reader and worship leader, and by Lainey, who is our junior deacon and will lead us in our opening prayer. So it's good to be with you. Thank you for being in worship with us. And I welcome Sue to give our deacons greetings. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the deacons. Uh, so how the chat works is we'd like to have you post your joys and concerns in capital letters with either joy or concern. Um, remembering that this is a public platform, so consider privacy when using names, perhaps leaving off the last name. And we have begun to send our church group emails through Constant Contact. So if you haven't received a weekly email from North Madison Congregational Church in the last few weeks, please check your junk and spam folders. Uh, there probably will be there. Yeah. So with that, we hope that you're in a comfortable, quiet place. Um, and Will you please mute your
Amen. And now Delaney will lead us in our gathering blessing. The world now is too dangerous and too beautiful. For anything but love. So, may your eyes be so blessed you see God in everyone. Your ears so blessed you hear the cry of the poor. May your hands be so blessed that everything you touch is sacrament. May your feet be so blessed you run to those who need you. And may your heart be so opened, so set on fire, that your love changes everything. Amen. Thank you, Delaney. This is a song from our Lutheran days. We've done it in church a few times and we'd love to have you sing along with us. It's a simple round. Father, I adore you. Jesus, I adore you. Spirit, I adore you. And the middle part is lay my life before you. And it winds up with how I love you. Laura's gonna start. Father, I adore you. time for our children's story so let's call the children to our screen and Sue Kenny will lead us in our children's time my name is Sue Kenny I'm going to be doing the children's message today for the very first time the person who has donated a lot of these rocks for me for the demonstration her name is Annette Chittenden and she's an artist she's a former art teacher and she sells some of these rocks at our craft show. Outside my office, inside my planter, there was a rock. It said Nurse's Rock, a painted rock. And I thought that was so nice, it really kind of lifted my spirits. And I thought it was a nice idea for us to gather together today and maybe a little, learn a little bit more about rock painting. Um, I think it's also a good act of kindness where we can bring joy to other people and spread hope during this difficult time. So first thing that you want to do is to gather some rocks. You can get some rocks maybe in your yard. So what you want to do is make sure all the dirt is off. I use this paint, put a little paint, show you here, on a piece of cardboard. And I just painted this rock. It didn't take any time at all. Very nice, very solid. This is a white acrylic pen, paint pen. <clears throat> I wrote with the white pen, I wrote be kind. What I'd like to do right now is to show you how to draw the little dots. What I did was put a little pin inside the end of a pencil. Here's a three, couple of straight pins. This one has a very small tip. This one has a bigger tip and even a giant tip. But I am going to use this medium sized tip. So I'm going to just dot this and dip it in the paint and dot 
paint dot paint all the way around just to show you the clear nail polish you can use after the rock dries you can put a coat of clear nail polish over what you have painted probably would let it dry overnight I'll just give you a quick demonstration Let me give you some examples here, how they can go into a little flower pot. It says spread joy, perhaps in your garden. I miss you. And over here, you are loved. Remember that you are loved. It's really nice to get out our creative talents. It not only benefits us, the giver, but it also benefits the receiver. So I just want to remind you again that we are all in this together and we will get through this. Thank you, Sue. And here's Linda to read our scripture. Today's scripture comes from the gospel of John chapter 10 verses 1 through 10. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'm going to ask um, our worshipers to suspend posting in the chat during the sermon. Um, it's, it's distracting for some folks who see it pop up in their peripheral vision. So uh, if you would just please try to curtail the chat during the sermon, that would be wonderful kindness to our fellow worshipers. So this passage is an interesting passage. I, I love Jesus in these sheep metaphors. In fact, once I served a church in Woodmont, um, Connecticut on their staff in an interim capacity, and we, we brought a live sheep to worship because they had doors off the sanctuary. And so we all walked out through the sanctuary and had uh, a friend with a sheep that was in its, uh, the stand for shearing. And we learned about caring for sheep and the shearing of sheep and really what a pain in the neck sheep can be <laughs> to keep. They're wonderful, but, um, but they're also a lot of work. And it's also been said that sheep 
when you think about Jesus comparing the sheep and the goats, sheep are not the brightest of beasts. Anybody who's had sheep can affirm this. They're just not so smart. And so the fact that Jesus is repeatedly compared to a shepherd and that we are compared to the sheep, <laughs> you know, says something about who we are in our spiritual and our discipleship journey. But this passage particularly is interesting to me because I'm thinking more and more about the fact that Jesus taught in parables and that Jesus came out of a Near Eastern context, not that different from a Buddhist context, really. That part of the world and that way of thinking was distinctly different from our part of the world and our way of thinking today in contemporary history. And so we tend to read these stories as literal stories. Jesus is a shepherd and we are sheep. And we see a beautiful caring relationship with the shepherd who cares for the sheep, right? God, the shepherd, thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me and protect me from my enemies. And I think that that is true. That is a very beautiful symbolism. And I, I think those roles are evocative of a, of a real truth in our, our re discipleship relationship. But I've also been thinking about this Near Eastern piece and the fact that Jesus, like a Near Eastern teacher that he was, taught in parables, which are like koans, right? When Jesus says, I'm the shepherd, I'm the gate, my sheep know my voice, there are other voices that may pretend to be shepherds. And society follows those voices. But my sheep know my voice, and my voice is the gate through which we pass to arrive in heaven. So long I was taught that that was about literally going to heaven. That if you were not a Christian, you could not get to heaven because Jesus was the only way. That's us reading this passage through the historic context of the cultures that have come after Jesus. I'm not sure that that's what Jesus himself meant. Reading this passage with more of a Near Eastern mindset, it strikes me that this is really, it's a mystical passage. Jesus, the way, is Jesus the spiritual practitioner. And the way need not necessarily be us professing Jesus as the one true savior in order to get to heaven. It's not necessarily transactional in that way. It's Jesus, the spiritual teacher, who's saying, if you cultivate a deep spirituality like I have cultivated, if you align your life and your living, your spiritual practices, your lifestyle choices, the way you distribute your resources, your gifts, your talents, your time, your treasure, those things will open up a space in you for God to come in. And if you want that gate to be opened in you so that God can become more and more present, the way to open the gate that's already within you, to open heaven within you, is to live as I live, to do as I do, to pray as I pray, to love as I love. There are many other ways to live, Jesus acknowledges. There are many other voices and many other shepherds but they will not get you into the kingdom of heaven, which doesn't mean after we die. It means right now to be fully alive and fully human, to be fully compassionate, and fully awake to the godliness within us, to our identities as beloved children of God. We have some work to do. 
And we have an invitation from Jesus about how to do that. And a promise that when Jesus departs, the spirit that was in Jesus came into all those on the Jesus path as much as we allow it. So there is some transactional nature to this relationship. We do have to do something. But the something is more about opening our hearts and practicing that openness. And if you go back and read all of Jesus' teachings through this lens, you begin to see a mystical teacher who is saying, love your enemy. Not because God's going to be mad and punish you if you don't, which is how we've interpreted it. Love your enemy because that is how you practice love when love is the hardest. And that is how you grow your sacred capacity for compassion, for understanding, for generosity. Love your enemy because it's easy to love your friends and you don't grow. It's like a muscle. If you rest easily in the chair, you don't grow. You have to go to the gym. And it's the same with love. It's the same with deepening our spiritual relationship. We have to show up. We have to put the time and the work in. We have to open ourselves with prayer, and generosity, and compassionate practice to that gate to begin to swing open within us. The more and more godliness can seep through and we can become more and more transformed. The rabbis say that you practice Sabbath because Sabbath is a foretaste of heaven. And if you don't practice heaven now, how can you possibly manage it when you get there? Jesus was a rabbi. There's something right about this way of thinking. If we don't practice our godliness, our belovedness, our sacrificial generosity, our, our tender, compassionate love now, how will we do with it when we get there? We have an invitation to develop ourselves. And Jesus promises a spirit to come and be with us as we go. It's an amazing promise. But Jesus also acknowledges that there are lots of voices competing. And that's part of the work. That's part of the work. Is to distill, to discern where the Spirit's voice is speaking to us. So this uh, May begins with May 1st, which is May Day. And I grew up celebrating May Day. My mom would make up May baskets for her friends and deliver them at daybreak. When I got to college, there were Norse dancers who would dance with the bells jingling at daybreak on May 1st. There are all of these strange and wonderful practices that go with May 1st. But one that I did not know about until college was May Day as a workers holiday, an international day of activism for workers. It's more than a century old, this May Day practice. And it began, as I wrote in my newsletter, and if you're not getting the newsletter, please look, as Sue said, in your uh, spam or your trash files, because we have changed our platform. And I think some folks' emails are going there. We don't want you to miss all the things that are happening around church. We want to stay connected to you. But May 1st began as a workers' holiday because workers were fighting for an eight-hour day. Imagine we take for granted that many of us work hard and we use that as a badge of uh, something, you know. Well, I work constantly, I never rest. But legally in our country, we have protections now for our hourly workers. We have a minimum wage. We have an eight-hour work week. We have a work day. We have a 40-hour work week. We have guarantees of rest. We have guarantees that children can't work under a certain age. All of those things came incrementally because people fought for them. That was godly work. Those were people who were standing up for the rights, the human rights and the sanctity of individual humans and families to have meaningful rest, to protect their health, 
to earn a living wage, to have appropriate ways to protect their family's health, to have a roof over their heads that meets their family's needs. Those were not rights that were just given to us in the United States or across the world. They're rights people fought for. And often we say that those fights are political fights and that people on one side or another side are in opposing political parties. And sometimes the church gets on board with one or another party or divides itself and stands with each, fights. But from a, a Christian perspective, from a Jesus follower perspective, those are not political fights, not primarily. They're fights about love. Loving our neighbors, ensuring that there's enough for all, ensuring that there's safety for all. Jesus spent his whole ministry finding the widows, the orphans, the incarcerated folks, the lepers, the people who had a rough go because society left them behind, because society didn't take care of them, because society didn't protect them. That's what Jesus did. That was his ministry. That's the gate that he calls us to go through, to open our heart and look for who's hurting and do all we can to ease, to heal, to soothe, to change that hurt and the places it came from. May 1st is also now called Labor in the Pulpit. Sorry, labor in the pulpit Sunday. Because there's so much work that we as the church have let get away from us. We've allowed people to say this is political work, and it's political work we step back because we don't want politics in church. But I can only imagine Jesus, the shepherd, calling us and wondering why we don't recognize his voice anymore. Why we've come to believe that his voice is the voice of a political party or a candidate or, and that that doesn't speak to us. But in fact, Jesus' voice is in the protesters. Jesus' voice is in the essential workers who, so many of whom, have been putting their lives and the lives and safety of their families on the line in jobs where they don't make a living wage and don't have health care and don't have paid time off and don't have paid medical leave and don't have adequate child care for their children or even safe neighborhoods. Essential workers, many of whom are people of color who get pulled over by the police because they're wearing a face mask and they're a man, they look like a thug. And so they're making choices about whether to wear a face mask to stay safe and healthy and keep their family safe and healthy or whether to leave the face mask off so that they don't seem like a threat to store security or police officers who may pull them over and may have rough things ensue. Essential workers who work three jobs to make ends meet for their families because we don't have a livable minimum wage anymore in our country. Those essential workers are beloved children of God who are exactly the people, I think, who Jesus, if the Gospels were written today, who Jesus would be sitting with, talking to, marching with, helping to feed. This COVID-19 moment has made a lot of things much clearer, I think, for many of us who have been comfortable and able to tell ourselves that these problems are too big, and too hard. But that's the work. That's where Jesus is, is in those difficult things that help to protect people and ensure their safety and their quality of life to help people live 
the lives they were born to live. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and my sheep follow when I call. I am the gate. I pray that this COVID-19 will help all of us to tune our ears to where Jesus is calling us, to point our feet and our eyes at that gate, and we will find our way through by helping our neighbors who need us now more than ever to find their way forward, that we will begin to work on transforming our communities, our governmental systems, our legislation, that will appreciate people in real ways that shape their lives, and not just with our card cardboard cutouts of appreciation in our windows, but by really putting our hearts where the work is, where Jesus is calling us to be. Thanks be to God. Sorry, I got a little worked up this morning. It's hard because these are big questions and they're, they're hard to think about and process, but they're important. And I do believe that with God and with one another, we can do it. There's that hundredth monkey concept. When just enough of us start to become awakened and lean in. And I think Jesus was worried about how he would stay connected to all of us as he left his disciples. And I think that's what brought him to that moment at the table in the upper room so long ago before his crucifixion. And then again to the table after his resurrection, over and over. So if you have your communion elements nearby, this is the time to draw them near to you. And this morning, we will recollect the story after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, my friend and colleague, Tyler Connolly, suggested this to me, and I, I love it. I think this is beautiful. Instead of looking at our usual scripture, around communion this morning, I'd like to remember the story that we read in last week's lectionary of the disciples on the Emmaus Road. It's after the resurrection, and two of them were walking along to the village called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with one another about all that had happened, Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, and then that the women had gone to the tomb and found his body missing and said that there were angels there. The two of them were very troubled and suddenly they were met on the road by a man they didn't recognize. And the man asked them what they were talking about and they were surprised because they thought everyone must have heard what had happened. But they told Jesus the story because it was Jesus, that man. Jesus recognized them, but they in their grief or confusion or lack of imagination didn't recognize him. So they walked along together and they talked to them about what had happened and then he began to teach them because that's what Jesus did, every opportunity he got. And as they got near to the village where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going to head on his way, but they urged him saying, stay with us because it's almost evening. The day's nearly over. It's getting dark. So Jesus went in and he stayed with them. And when he sat at the table, he took the bread. He blessed it and he broke it. And when he gave it to them, Their eyes were opened in the breaking of the bread. And when they recognized him, he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road and opening the scriptures to us? And do not our hearts burn within us now as we look out into the world and all that's wrong 
and all that could be right. Do our hearts not burn within us? And is that not Jesus calling? So this morning, I invite you, if you haven't already, to take your bread, whatever you've got, your saltine, your bagel, your muffin, and break it. And take your cup. And let's bless them all. Will you pray with me? Holy God, open our eyes and open our hearts. Bless these elements as we receive them. Let us feel Jesus' presence with us at these tables, our tables, just as he intended. Let us feel our hearts burning within us as we look out at the world across our table and begin to see again anew with Jesus' eyes and love with Jesus' heart. Fill us with Jesus' courage and compassion and spirit so we may overcome our fear and begin to live the lives Jesus promises us we can together. We thank you in advance for your presence here. We thank you for the gift that Jesus is to us. We thank you for the gift of the spirit that Jesus promises is still here with us in this breaking of bread, in this drinking of cup, in this living of our lives. So let us love as you call us and equip us to love of God and be with us now as we share these elements in our homes with one another. Amen. Now, as you begin to share your elements, I'm going to share my screen. We have a musical offering for you and a prayer to follow. Let's break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let's pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And we'll come back to our generosity moment because now we'll turn to our joys and concerns. So, so this is the special time that we share our joys and concerns of our congregations. Um, Heather Crawford has a joy to be at church with sunshine, toads trilling, robins in my pear tree, and swifts overhead. So poetic. 
Uh, Joy from Linda. Last week, I thought my old kitty Mike was booking a trip over the Rainbow Bridge. Thankfully, he decided to cancel it. Um, concern from Karen. Her daughter is positive for COVID. However, the good news is there's no fever or respiratory problems, and she's isolated at her group home with loving caregivers. Please pray for her uncomplicated recovery. Sue Timoney Hall has a concern for all frontline workers. And a joy for all who are leading us in worship today and sharing their gifts with love. Janice, a concern for Adam's dad. We are still learning the best path to deal with his pancreatic cancer. Um, concern from Carol, please pray for a friend's father who's in a nursing home and was diagnosed with COVID this week. Yeah, I want to add to my next door neighbor here, Lucy, husband is in a nursing home with dementia so she hasn't been able to see him as so many people have not been able to visit their loved ones and now she's been very sick for more than a week i think she probably has covid there's so many families that are touched that way um carol has a concern please pray for a close friend who lost her beloved dog this week oh. she's devastated it's a hard week to lose a pet from Gail, uh, the good news that a family member diagnosed with COVID is getting better with no fever the last three days. Please keep praying for her. We will. There's also a, a prayer from um, Kristen Poliski about Dave Purcell, who was killed in a motorcycle accident on Tuesday. He was 52 and leaves behind a wife and a really new marriage and a blended family. And so we pray for all of them and for the driver that backed out and didn't see him on his motorcycle. Um, Sandy, a concern for Pete's sister and mom. Mom has COVID and sister has had a stroke. Prayers for recovery. Concern from Karen, please pray for the souls and families of two friends who contracted COVID. One friend passed this week and the other will have life support disconnected today. I'm so sorry. It's so hard to lose friends. Prayers also, uh, happy prayers for Mary Beth, uh, Barb's daughter, who uh, has gone to Nashville and is starting a new life there with her friend Anna. So blessings on their new home. And for all the young people who are displaced by lack of work right now, the people of all ages that are trying to find new beginnings. Um, let's see. Concern from Laura, please pray for my coworker's mother who's in a nursing home with Alzheimer's and now has COVID and is not doing well. Yeah. I would like to share a joy that my sister in law um, has recovered from COVID and is now doing well, but she had been hospitalized, but she's better now. Okay, well, thank you, Sue. If we've missed anyone, we're sorry. We know God has seen them. And for those on Facebook, if we haven't seen your prayers, I will catch up with you later on. Um, so let's, let's unite our hearts. Oh, Holy One, you promise that where two or more are gathered, your spirit is there and intervenes with sighs too deep for human words. And this is a time of deep sighing. And that we are not gathered as a community all in one room under one roof. We are united in our hearts with one another and with all those who are hurting and who are hopeful right now. We we know as people of faith, we hold the challenge together with the good. We hold our hope together with our longings. We hold our joy with our grief and sadness. So God, we pray that your spirit would 
wrap us all up and hold us, hold us aloft, keep us afloat through these times where so much just seems so hard. We pray especially for those who are grieving. We pray for those who are on ventilators. We pray for the medical staff and the CNAs and the security guards and the people working in the hospital kitchens. We pray for the gas station attendants and the bus drivers. We pray for the grocery store checkers and stockers. We pray for the guys who are putting the baskets back in their stalls. God, we pray for everyone who is out there doing what they have to do to keep the rest of us alive. Help us, God. Change our hearts. Equip us so that we know how to live forward in new ways that keep our most vulnerable more, more sacred and safer. Help us, God, to get through this time of grief without letting go of our hope or our joy. Help us to come through this time galvanized to create a future together with you that brings a little more heaven to earth. We thank you for the gift of your son who teaches us. We thank you for the gift of all the ways you reach out to us through the beautiful sunshine, that lifts our spirits through the help of supportive friends and colleagues, through the gift of this church. We thank you, God, for the springtime. It helps so much on days that feel so dreary. God, for those who are alone, for those who are overwhelmed by too many people in their house for too darn long, for the teachers, for the social workers, for the first responders of all sorts, and for all those who are quietly serving when they might be normally invisible. On this May Day, we thank you for the workers. And we pray that we will have their backs as they have our backs. God, it's good to be together but sometimes we're alone with our feelings and our depression, our addictions, our anger, our slothfulness, our lesser selves are hard to battle in this time of quarantine and uncertainty. So God, we, we lift up the hidden places in ourselves to you. We ask your grace and your help. And we pray that all those who are members of our church and our community know there's no shame in being human. There's no shame in being imperfect or broken. It's part of our journey. And I pray that in this church, folks who need a little more support feel comfortable reaching out to ask, knowing that we will reach back with kindness and empathy. We are in this together. We pray in the name of your son who tried in every way he could to teach us about that kindness and empathy, to teach us that no one, no one was not good enough to be part of God's community. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we go to our generosity moment. Hi everyone, my name is Dawn Barber and I have been a part of the North Madison Congregational Church community for the past 24 years and it is a great community. 
we say that we are the church. We, the people, are the church, which is true. But we also have a beautiful sanctuary that is just waiting for us to return to. And it needs our support, our financial support. Simply put, we have to take care of our house of God. So I'd like to share a story of generosity. Um, it goes back to my trip to Israel, which was eight weeks ago. A lot has changed since then, but it was a wonderful trip. And um, on the third day, we were in Bethlehem and um, we got a chance to go to a jewelry store and I wanted to get a, a Jerusalem cross. So I was looking at the plain ones and our um, tour guide, Mike, said, I have the one for you. And he brought me to another case and he um, he showed me this Jerusalem cross that has a coin in the center. So I loved it, so I had to have it. And I'm going to read you the story of it while I hold it up so you can see what it looks like. So the coin in the center is called a widow's mite. And in Mark chapter 12, verse 42, one and 42 it tells the story that jesus sat down opposite the place where offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury many rich people threw in large amounts but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny calling his disciples to him jesus said I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So, I love this story. It just reminds us that the value of a gift isn't determined by its amount, but by the spirit in which it was given. So, Remember that gifts are of any any size are pleasing to God when they are given out of gratitude and a spirit of generosity. So that's my generosity moment. Thank you for listening and hope to see you all soon. And if you would like, there may be a live link popping up in the chat, <clears throat> um, or you can go to our website directly. And I am going to screen share a beautiful um, compilation of photos of springtime and creation that uh, Heather Crawford put together for us with a rudder piece by our choir. I'm hoping I'm going to screen share it. Hold on a moment. Um, we were revisiting this piece this week because we couldn't, I couldn't get it to play right last week and I'm having trouble getting it to go again and I don't know why. I'm so sorry. It's so beautiful. I really want you all to see it. So why does my computer not see it there? Huh. Well, let's see. I'll try again.
Amen. I'm glad we got to see that this week. It was such a beautiful piece. Thank you, Heather, for creating it for us. And choir, we miss you. I know you miss each other and you miss Linda. And it's so wonderful to have these recordings so we can get a little taste of, of what we miss. So thank you for that. So I think that that is where we are. I'm just double checking my order of worship now to make sure I haven't overlooked anything. Uh, but that, that's, we're, we're there. So I would like to thank all of you who have um, tuned in to our, our live worship streaming on um, email or Facebook. Um, Please do check your email to be sure you're getting our emails and that they're not going into your junk folder now that we have this new platform in place. It looks like we have about 62, hi Jonathan, 62 screens um, on uh, Zoom today. And I know we have more friends on Facebook as well now that Facebook is working for us. And it's wonderful to see you, Jonathan. And uh, if you would like to be part of our worship service, and we would love to have you. So contact me or Linda or Sue Timmy Hall, and um, we will we will be happy to include you if you have poems or prayers or music. Um, Barb says she loves Sue and her tender heart and cry. You know we have a crying ministry here at North Madison Congregational Church where we understand that uh, crying is a spiritual gift, and so we embrace it. Sandy, I hope you see Jonathan says, Jonathan, your smile kills me. It's true. You have a beautiful smile, man. That is electric. <laughs> Another sign that God is with us. So thank you all for being here. And remember that life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the God who loves us, who made us, and who makes this journey with us, be with us all now and forever. Amen. And now I would like to share with you our shalom. Just pull it up here. Here it comes. Um, this shalom for us is um, from Gail Faithful. So here we go. Shalom to you now, shalom my friend. May God's full mercy be with you, my friend, in all your living, through all your loving, Christ be your shalom, Christ be your shalom. Shalom to you now, shalom, my friend. May God's full mercies be with you, my friend, in all your living, through all your loving, Christ be your shalom. Christ be your shalom. Amen. So good people, good weeping people and smiling people and loving people and hoping people. Go in peace. Our worship is ended, so our service may begin. <laughs>